Hello and welcome to Open, the show opening the Bronx and the rest of the world to you. I'm Kibben Aline covering for Darren Jaime and today we'll update you on what's happening in and around our borough and New York City. Coming up, we'll delve into an organization providing comprehensive services for LGBTQ plus New Yorkers with a focus on justice. Then, we'll explore a community development organization dedicated to enhancing access to resources in the Bronx for thriving neighborhoods. Following that, we'll have a discussion with a first-generation college student heading to college on a full scholarship, exploring the significance of their journey. After that, we'll shift our focus to an event centered around the exploration of the globe's fragile, resilient, and threatened ecosystems. Later on in the show, we'll address how individuals cope with schizophrenia and ways to combat stigma through increased education about treatment options. So stay tuned, all this and much more is headed your way because we're now officially open. Hello everyone, I'm Kim Aline and you are now watching Open, a live program bringing the Bronx and New York City straight to you. We also want to welcome our viewers to the Manhattan Neighborhood Network as Open is being broadcast simultaneously on MNN's channels. You can stay connected to us on all social media platforms at BronxNet TV. Some things have been going on throughout this past week. We'll take you through it with some Bronx updates. We start with community news. The Longwood Academy for Discovery launched a community laundry room, providing a vital resource for local families. Our BronxNet reporter Chris Camella has more details. Next to Westchester Avenue here at the Longwood Academy of Discovery, a new initiative is underway set by school and city officials that will ultimately help tons of family and students in the surrounding community. A celebration unfolds at this public school as a gathering of community, family, staff, and city officials unveil the grand opening of their first community school laundry room. <laughs> Deemed a vital resource for local families, this initiative is made possible through a collaborative effort between New York Edge, the community school partner, and Councilman Rafael Salamanca Jr., both of whom provided essential funding. According to NYE Representative Kachina Raspress Pierce, this initiative is a prime example of what can be achieved when organizations work together towards a common goal. Our goal is to make schools like this like a community hub. And so we want to have more resources for families to bring them into the building. Um, and this laundromat is the first step in the right direction for us. Um, we have a variety of other services we're looking to expand on um, throughout the next couple of years working with the school. But we're excited for today at the ribbon cutting and really having families here with us to actually see it actually happen. So these are the newest units that are here in this building. Right next to the entrance, two washer, two dryer. They're going to be available to community family members and students who are in need of them. To access the laundry room, families simply register a time slot on the school's website, and a school coordinator will confirm availability. This approach to addressing community needs is reflective of the partnership between the school, city officials, and NPOs aiming at providing a hub for families, which will ultimately aid those who cannot regularly access laundry facilities. Councilman Salamanca Jr. has a long history of advocating for public schools in his district and says this project is no different. We've noticed that it's been a burden. And so we want to fill that gap and we want to fill that burden. And so today is just an example of out of the box thinking on how we can help families that are struggling to help fill that gap. And that's exactly what this laundry room will do today. He's allocated $300,000 for this initiative in addition to his previous district funding of 500 k for a schoolyard revitalization project and another 300 k for tech investments, such as access to Chromebooks and smart boards in numerous classrooms. 
The struggles faced by low-income families in this district are denied by no one, reinforced by the highest number of homeless shelters found here out of any district in New York City. However, city officials are committed to working with partners across the Bronx and finding innovative solutions to support these families. The community laundry room is only one example of ensuring no parents, residents, or students are left out to dry. So, you know, as someone who's born and raised here and lives in this community, it's my responsibility to ensure that there's out-of-the-box thinking and that we address issues that are affecting my community. Reporting from BronxNet, I'm Chris Cumella. Thank you, Chris. In other news, My Brother's Keeper hosts a financial literacy fair showcasing the students' financial literacy projects they have been working on all year round. Our Bronx Star reporter Kyrie Moody has a story. My Brother's Keeper hosts a financial literacy fair for Bronx high schools located in District 7, 9, and 12. These high schools that are represented here today have researched and put together their own financial literacy projects. And today here at Monroe College is the showcasing of those projects. I planned a girl called Libby. She's from Boston. She just moved to Boston. She's a lieutenant. I planned out her um, her financial, how she would plan her, how she would distribute her money, how she would allocate her funds, right? She makes $3,000 a month, 50K a year. I planned out how she would allocate this money towards different things, entertainment, housing, food, all those kinds of things. Here's what they learned while putting together these projects. We've been learning about how to uh, play games to learn how to budget and um, save money and buy, sell stocks and just different things uh, to learn about how to make more money. I don't really teach them stuff, but I ask them more questions now because I feel like it has made me think of more stuff. So it's made me think about how they budget, how much money we make. It's made me think about like how much I be spending personally. So it's made me like question them a lot and about their financial reasons. And like, you know, I'll be trying to help them a little bit like teaching them ways how to get out of debt that they may not have known about and stuff. Superintendent of Bronx Public High Schools for District 7, 9, and 12, Dr. Renee Part tells us why this financial literacy fair is not only important, but necessary for the South Bronx. It is a district initiative to just increase the knowledge and awareness of making important financial uh, decisions. And we believe that uh, our high school scholars, they're getting ready to go off into the real world. So we are training them now. Parent coordinator at Bronx Envision Academy says that she notices that the school system doesn't teach financial literacy like they did when she herself was a student. Uh, back in elementary school, I remember um, the bank came in and they told us about checking accounts. And by the time my kids got into school, I didn't see that anymore. A recent study from the University of Cambridge showed that kids form money habits as early as seven years old. The earlier you start teaching your kids about financial literacy, the better. Reporting for BronxNet, Kyrie Moody. Thank you, Kyrie. Well, that's all for the Bronx updates. We have to take a quick break, but we'll have more for you when we return. Welcome back. Harlem United champions health equity for the LGBTQ plus community, focusing on those often overlooked, which are individuals with chronic conditions, the unhoused, older adults, and people of color. 
Over the years, Harlem United has expanded to address diverse health care needs and has steadfastly advocated for social justice, remaining deeply rooted in the community. Joining us now is Harlem United CEO Jacqueline Kilmer and client and board member Shakira Stevens. Thank you both so much for joining me. Thank, Thank you, you for having, having us. us. Now, uh, Jacqueline or Jackie, um, Harlem United has a rich history dating back to 1988. Can you share how the organization's mission has evolved over the years and what its primary focus is today? Yes, definitely. You're so right. Um, Starting in 1988, a very small group of dedicated advocates and members of the faith community uh, came together because they were devastated at what they saw happening around them. People were, in some cases, literally dying on the street from AIDS, um, and they couldn't take that. So they banded together and gave of their hearts um, and a space in the basement of a church in central Harlem. Um, in order to provide whatever care and comfort and services they could provide at the time to those who were living with and dying from HIV and AIDS. Um, so the, the mission really at that time was, and the goal was just to be able to provide whatever services they could and to make sure that no one was dying alone um, and they knew that they were loved and then they knew that they had community and a place to go when they were able to. Um, over time, as, thank goodness, uh, treatment for HIV and AIDS uh, advanced um, and the needs of our clients actually grew um, with, along with that, we expanded our services to include things like primary care and dental services, um, housing services, and uh, not just for people living with HIV and AIDS, but people who are suffering from other chronic physical and mental health and substance use. Um, issues and the homeless and really from our very beginning our mission core mission has remained the same which is to advance health equity through all of our services so housing health care and harm reduction services and today we provide not only world-class health care for people living with HIV and AIDS but for other uh, chronic physical and mental health conditions and substance use um, and provide supports for those who are homeless um, and try to get them housed as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for giving a little history and the importance of the organization and how it's evolved today. So thank you so much for that. Um, Shakira, you know, what personal experiences have you had with Harlem United that illustrates, you know, the impact that we heard about on the community? Well, I started out, um, I had my own apartment um, I suffered from depression, and so I found myself isolating most of the times. I would meet with my case manager, and you know, she would tell me about Harlem United. I'm like, eh, I don't know about it. Mm. She was like, don't, just give it a try, you know? She said that for like several different times, and then I, vi I finally came from my primary appointment one time, and I looked, and I seen a community of people you know, inside the ADAC, um, the adult day um, program, right? And so I started my process there. I walked in, everyone welcomed, welcomed me with open arms. Um, I started my primary more, um, I started going to my appointments more often and making sure that that stayed number one, you know, because my health comes first. And um, I've been there ever since I've had, um, I partake in the shows, I sit on the board, you know, I wanted to be in a position where I was able to give back, and that for me is the give back. Being affording the newcomer that comes into the program the same services and opportunity that I was when I first welcome, walked in, so. Yeah. Now, I think you said something that was so interesting, which a lot of people feel is that, you know, in the beginning when we hear about organizations that um, we here are supposed to help us. Sometimes there's a little bit of resistance where you're like, I don't know. Uh, Jackie, can you just talk about how you were able, how the organization was able to kind of gain the trust of the people that they're supposed to serve? Sure, yeah, it's so important, right? Because uh, you can have all kinds of bad experiences and that um, will really keep you from getting the services that you need. But for us, uh, it's really, it's providing services through uh, what we call a trauma-informed care approach, and that really looks at the whole person. It looks at the, um, it looks at their life experiences, 
particularly for the LGBTQ plus community, the discrimination and the stigma that, that they face among other traumas and really providing services and care through that lens to make sure that we're addressing uh, the, the needs of the particular individual. And I think, as Shakira said, we, we strive to provide community and family for people who may not have that outside of, uh, outside of Harlem United um, and really provide a safe space for people to come and just be who they are. Now, Shakira, can you talk about the importance of, you know, just kind of expanding on this idea of building strong bonds within the community to combat isolation and stigma? And, you know, what are some ways you contribute to this effort? Well, being a part, like, I would say being the groups that they have, right? We're able to sit down and we're able to share our stories, being able to identify with someone else who's going through the same experiences that I've gone through helps build that that bond, that relationship that's so vitally important for an individual's process. You know, um, I, I was scared that there wasn't anybody, you know, but to know that there is some, you know, by out there that, hey, they've been through what I've been through. Okay. I don't, I don't feel like I need to isolate as much now. You know, I have some place to go. I have purpose now, you know, so yeah. And Jackie, you know, looking ahead, what do you envision for the future of LGBTQ plus healthcare? And how is Harlem United preparing to meet these future challenges? Well, I see just an ever increasing need for uh, compassionate, culturally competent uh, and comprehensive care for the LGBTQ plus community particularly as we see um, an increase in refugees and immigrants coming into the state, um, many of whom are coming from countries where they f uh, suffer from or face persecution because of their sexual identity or gender I sexuality or gender identity, um, and also because of the ever-increasing hate-filled legislation within our own country. Um, so we have to we have to create those spaces and access to the kind of care that Harlem United provides um, in order to really address all of the issues that need to be addressed and you know from a great example and this happened recently at Harlem United we provided care for a young woman um, at the nest which is our flagship uh, health center on West 133rd Street in Central Harlem, and she came to us for a variety of healthcare issues. She was in the process of seeking asylum uh, because she had been persecuted in her home country um, and at the time was facing deportation back to her home country. Uh, she was unfortunately had couldn't afford a lawyer, of course, and had no one else to assist her. So she was trying to maneuver through the very complicated asylum process by herself. The nurse who saw her, um, who has had some training in this area, was able to provide her with a detailed, written, very detailed uh, medical affidavit that she was able to uh, submit with her application for asylum. She won asylum. Um, and is now on her way to becoming a U.S. citizen. So, you know, we see that our, our role is to really be able to provide those kinds of services um, to everyone in the community. Well, you know, I want to thank you both so much for joining us and kind of sharing some of the work that you do to empower the, those in our community. So thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. For more information, you can visit their website at harlemunited.org and follow them on Instagram at harlemunitednyc. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with more Open right after this. Happy anniversary to BronxNet 30 years. Wow. Brings back so many memories. This exact studio that, we were, that I'm in right now, I broadcast out of here. This must have been in around 2003. I mean, time flies by so quickly. I started out here, it was either, it was either Mr. Gary Axelbank and Mr. Batch with Lady Morsar. We used to do a show here called In the Neighborhood. And I brought so many different guests on this show. To be able to bring your voice to the community is very, powerful.
to bring hip hop and spirituality. I brought my pastor in this same studio, Pastor Geno Jennings, and I'm sure you guys know who Pastor Geno Jennings is. That's rough and some disciplined teaching. BronxNet is something that we need to uplift our communities because this is a platform that we can come and if you have a vision that's in your mind going into your heart, you can use it to do uplifting things for your community. Welcome back. Founded on the principle that everyone deserves a healthy and vibrant community, Wedco has been making significant strides in building sustainable, affordable homes and providing access to essential resources like high-quality education, healthy food, cultural programming, and economic opportunities. Here now to tell us more is Wedco's Vice President of Community Development, Carrie McLean, and Senior Program Manager of Commercial Revitalization, Jamila, D Jamila Diaz. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me. I know that was a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, once again, thank you both so much for joining me. Uh, can you start by giving us an overview of Wedco's approach to community development? Our approach um, at Wedco to community development is, as you said, we believe that all neighborhoods deserve all the resources that they need here in the Bronx to thrive. And so we focus on neighborhood planning, neighborhood advocacy, commercial revitalization, cultural programming, economic development, education and youth development, you name it. Um, if it helps our communities, if it brings hope and life um, and access, uh, that's what we uh, seek to provide. And can you kind of give us um, a little bit more about the core principles guiding your work in the South Bronx? Our core principles at WEDCO are really founded on listening to community. Um, it's so important for us to listen, to be able to design programs and services and really respond to what community members themselves identify as what their hopes and their dreams are for their community. Uh, one of the things that we do is we work with uh, community members, with merchants, some of which we'll talk about today uh, as well, uh, to improve quality of life uh, in neighborhoods. And uh, so those are the, some of the principles that guide us and we leverage and channel those principles through um, neighborhood advocacy as mentioned, advocating for uh, cleaner and safer streets. Um, we do outdoor festivals. Uh, we conduct research and conduct surveys with community members to do that listening. And then um, you know, we work with community members to uh, implement initiatives that uh, bring those uh, initiatives to bear. Now, today we're focusing on the work you're doing on the Southern Boulevard Commercial Corridor in Cortona Park East. Can you tell us about the Southern Boulevard Merchant Association that WEDCO helped to launch? Awesome. Uh, the Cortona East Southern Boulevard work that's being done with the Merchant Association, we have a group of leaders in the community, local mom and pops, who come together on a monthly basis to organize opportunities for advocacy, not only for their commercial corridor, but also for their neighborhood. So they come together and they think about ways and opportunities to help the neighborhood, and they move forward um, with those ways and opportunities. In addition to that, they come together and they provide festivals, uh, raffle, discount opportunities in the area, so we have a, a good group of merchants. Now, uh, Southern Boulevard is a huge part of the Bronx. Um, if you, in the Bronx, you know Southern Boulevard, uh, but I think that a lot of people aren't aware of some of the challenges that a lot of these small businesses face. Can you just highlight some of those challenges? Um, and you know, what are some ways uh, the organization is addressing these challenges? One of the overall uh, sort of challenges that all mom and pops face is foot traffic. Um, so they, uh, Cortona East is no different. Um, they're, they're worried about foot traffic opportunities and making sure that community residents and people in the neighborhood know that they have goods and services there available for them. And another challenge that they're facing, I would say, is safety. But I think New York City overall um, may be uh, facing that challenge. But there's safety uh, and a lot of uh, robbery, a lot of stealing, petty orphanage. So those are challenges that our businesses are, are facing. Now, much of your work on Southern Boulevard is funded by a grant from the New York City Department of Small Business Services. What is the goal of this grant and how is WEDCO utilizing it to benefit the community? The goal of the grant, I'll start us <laughs> off and Jim will take it away. The goal of the grant is really to um, really push and enhance commercial revitalization in the neighborhood, supporting the local economy. Local economic development is so crucial in all of our neighborhoods and we know that there are assets and there, there are talents in our neighborhood from small business owners to um, individuals who are um, who are workers in the neighborhood. And so our goal is through merchant organizing, um, through business support, 
um, through neighborhood beautification and cleanliness and some of the other uh, initiatives that Jamila will talk about to uh, leverage this, this grant that we have to bring those to bear in this community. As Kerry said, we have dedicated contractor for beautification and sanitation, meaning that our neighborhood is cleaned every day. Uh, if there's graffiti that needs to be removed, the graffiti is removed. Mm -hmm. If there's street pits mulching that needs to be done, so we have a thriving neighborhood when it comes to sanitation and beautification. We also have been able to provide robust services to business owners, meaning our business owners need technical assistance. So this grant allows us to provide with a business coach that one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. So if they receive a fine, if they're looking for financing, they have those services on site. We also have been able to provide uh, digital literacy, mm -hmm. meaning a lot of our business owners now are interacting with social media. And if they have a learning curve, where we have a dedicated uh, digital coach that's able to provide that learning curve. That's amazing. And I also want to add that so much of how we even pay is digital now. So I could imagine how useful that is and how a lot of these smaller organizations can kind of get on top of that. So I love to hear that. Um, I want to talk about your ongoing campaign called Local Love. Can you explain what this campaign entails and how it supports a local small businesses? It's exactly that local love. You know, once a year uh, in the city, we celebrate small business uh, day, usually around Thanksgiving time. However, we celebrate it in Cortona East all year long, meaning whenever there's an opportunity to celebrate a holiday, we promote local love, meaning what we're trying to do is make community residents aware that there are local mom and pops here that help this neighborhood thrive. And we want you to come out and we want you to buy from them mm -hmm. and frequent their business. Now for viewers who want to learn more about WEDCO or get involved in your initiatives, what are the best ways to do them? So our website at WEDCO is www.whedco.org, wedco.org, and the neighborhood website for the work that we do in Cortona East is www.southernboulevard.org, so that's southernblvd.org, and of course you can follow us on Instagram. Um, Southern Boulevards is at Southern Boulevard, and WEDCO is at WEDCO Speaks. And, you know, what do you hope to see for the future of this initiative? I know that um, just in the Bronx, there's a lot, of ha a lot of things happening, a lot of changes happening. What do you hope to see for the future of that? Well, we're looking, we're looking at it with building community and business wealth. It's important that as we think about thriving commercial corridors, we also think about our commercial resi our residents, um, not only about the commercial corridor, but our residents also. But it's looking at a lens of using this funding to be able to build community and business wealth. And I also want to add that um, when it comes to re revitalization, <laughs> um, I know that sometimes people often think of um, gentrification or they think that sometimes it's not for the community that lives there. Uh, you know, are there any ways that you combat those ideas? As Kerry said, we're always looking for community input. We listen. We listen to what community mm -hmm. residents are asking for. And of course, you can never make everyone happy um, all the time, but we try our best mm -hmm. to make sure that we're guided by community residents and business owners. And I think a key angle to our work is really about supporting local purchasing. That's a building community and business wealth goal. It's about local hiring as well. It's about how a cooperative economy, how a more community-minded economy, you know, everybody can help each other to rise together. Um, so that's the approach that we're taking, which is about really investing in community members who are already there. That's amazing. And I, I love to hear about the work that's being done. Um, and as I mentioned, that so many people in the Bronx, we uh, walk through these corridors all the time. We shop at these places. And so it's so amazing to see that um, there's actually work being done to support those businesses. Um, because over time, we have seen some of them close. So it's nice to see that there's uh, being a spotlight being put on them. So I want to thank you both so much for joining us and having this discussion. Thank, thank you, you so you. much. You. For more information, you can visit their website at whedco.org and follow them on Instagram at Wedco Speak. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with more open right after this. Hey everyone, it's your girl Kat from the Kitty Rose Lifestyle, also from the next chapter where we discuss Shades of Grey every week right here at BronxNet, Saturdays at 11 p.m. Wow, 30 years. 30 years of BronxNet public access television. 
I'm a girl from Brooklyn and came to the Bronx 25 years ago, started my journey on BronxNet on public access television in 2016. And BronxNet is where I got my start. BronxNet, I feel like, is a home away from home. They support all of my endeavors, and I wouldn't have been able to be on any of the other channels if it wasn't for the fundamentals that I learned right here at my start here at BronxNet. So I am so appreciative. My son says I should stop telling people I'm from Brooklyn because I've been here now, Bronx Storm, for 22 years. So I'm so grateful and I wish you much success in 30 years, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 more. Because public access is necessary so that people like myself can have a voice. Yes, BronxNet, it's your girl Kat from Kitty Rose. Check me out every Saturday at 11 p.m. right here, Channel 68, the next chapter, where we discuss Shades of Grey. Mwah. Welcome back. As graduation season begins, it's a time of celebration and anticipation for many students and their families. Our next guest is a first-generation college attendee from Morris Heights in the Bronx who will be heading to Williams College this fall on a full scholarship with an impressive 4.2 GPA. Joining us now is the Fordham Preparatory School class of 2024 student, Alfonso Pimentel. Alfonso, thank you so much for joining us and congratulations. Yeah, thank you so much and thanks for having me. Now, can you share with us what it means to be a first generation college student heading to Williams College on a full scholarship, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, um, it means a lot to me because uh, I just want to be able to, um, I guess you could say like make it in life and uh, I feel like this is the first step that I need to in order for that goal that I have. Now, you know, what were the steps that you took to maintain an impressive 4.2 GPA while being um, active in track and field? Um, it's really just finding a balance. Uh, it took me a while. I know my freshman year was a little bit rough, but um, after that, you know, uh, sophomore year when I uh, was able to like find that, I guess, middle ground, um, it was pretty easy. And um, everything else came with uh, like the balance that I needed. <laughs> Now, what inspired you to pursue a dual degree in mechanical engineering and physics? Um, I, I would have to say like my passion uh, that I have for the science sciences. Uh, I really, um, I thought about doing something in mechanical engineering uh, after sophomore year because I really like um, chemistry. But f after junior year, I realized that physics was more my like, um, I was more suited for physics and I was looking at my options. So mechanical engineering was on the list and I thought that it'd be great to do something in that. Now, as I mentioned, you're a first-generation college student. Can you tell us about your mother's journey to the U.S. and how she has influenced your educational pursuits? Yeah, um, she uh, came to the U.S. in 2002, and she's, work she's the hardest worker that I know. Um, sacrificed so much for me to be in this seat, in this position, um, with the scholarship that I have. So uh, it's all, everything that she's done for me, I do it for her. And I'm just trying to reciprocate all that, all that sacrifice that she's done. Now, can you just explain, you know, what were some of the biggest challenges for you and your family, you know, and how did you overcome them? Um, I would have to say one of my biggest challenges is um, I really, like, didn't want to do track after freshman year. I quit, um, and as a matter of fact, I wanted to really do football, but uh, that didn't work out, and I thought about joining um, track again, and that's what I ended up doing. Um, I had an injury in my sophomore year where I tore my hamstring, but I was faced with a decision if I wanted to continue doing track or, you know, just not and stick to academics. But I wanted to continue doing track because I fell in love with uh, the sport. So um, recovery process took a little, uh, you know, it was a while. Um, I was out basically the entire sophomore year, but I came back junior year strong and yeah. Now, I'm curious to know, how has being a part of a sport, you know, while you were in school kind of help you stay on track and kind of, you know, like, uh, you know, give you that sense of, I guess, security or like that push, you know, because, you know, doing studies in schools while also doing a sport uh, can't be the easiest. I know there's a lot of time management with that. So can you just talk about, you know, your experience with that journey? Yeah, um, well, I know like um, with track, um, it's like, I wanted to do best, my best that I could do in both areas, right? And um, I would say academic side, I want to keep my grades up. You know, I have to make sure I study, have to make sure I do my homework so I, I could maintain that A that I want. And then in track, I have to make sure I'm training, I have to make sure I'm in the weight room, um, at practice, 
and because if not then I'll start falling behind and if I don't um, push myself to try to, to go to let's say a, tr a practice or you know um, choose to do homework and not procrastinate um, then I'm gonna start falling off and that's what I wanted to like avoid during my like high school experience and now how has the Jimmy Lee Scholars Fund and inner city Siller inner city scholarship fund help you in your academic journey yeah um i would say that was one of my biggest pushes uh to maintain my grades because that's one of the requirements to for the scholarship um i was very fortunate to um uh, obtain that scholarship um heading into my uh, high school uh, heading into high school so i was i'm very thankful for that and um one of the requirements is to maintain a good gpa and i was i wanted to make sure i would do that now, what would you say to other students who are considering applying for scholarships, but maybe feel a little hesitant to do so? Yeah, um, I would say like you really should um, apply to the scholarship, uh, even if you don't want to, because you don't know if you you know you'd get it. I know like for Williams, I never heard of the school until last year, when um, you know their coach reached out, and I wasn't interested in attending. But after um, talking with their coach and um, realizing that you know the school is like could provide me something that I would need to reach my goal, I was, I, I was set and you know, I was sold. I wanted to go to and attend. Now, I know this may be a, a pretty um, lengthy question for somebody your age, but what are your long-term career goals and how do you plan to achieve them? I know that's kind of in the future, uh, <laughs> but right now, you know, what would you say your career goals are? Um, I would have to say, uh, I really, um, so obviously finish um, college, um, have, you know, great f another four years of track, um, go into uh, try to get my master's and then join the workforce after that, maybe get a PhD. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. I love to hear it. Now, what advice would you give to other high school students who are facing similar challenges? Um, maybe no one in their family has gone to college. Maybe they come from a certain background, um, but they dream of attending college. What would you tell them? Um, I would tell them, you know, that they should focus on, on their academics um, and just focus on school because uh, education would get you a lot f like farther than what you'd think and I value that um, now b just because of what I've been able to do so I would have to say just stick to what you got and also you know I'm sure there are a lot of people probably watching and you know if there are young people watching can you talk about the importance of kind of still maintaining um, you know having fun as a kid but also prioritizing schoolwork can you talk about you know yeah. what that was like for you um i would it's, it's just that balance that i found um and once you it's once you find that balance yourself you know you just find like everything that you would want to do it'll like come um i you know i would obviously i would have practice and then school work but i would still have time to like you know hop on and play some games or like go out with some friends um after like a track meet and not worry and then, you know, but you also have to, like, hold yourself accountable and make sure, you know, if you do go out, do your homework once you come back home or something like that. Or if you have a practice, make sure you do your homework so, or study, you know. Okay, so. that's amazing. And it, and it proves that it can be done. Um, and I'm so glad to hear about the amazing work that you've done and what you're going to do in the future. Uh, so I want to thank you so much for joining us. And once again, congratulations um, on this achievement. Yeah, thank you so much. For more information, you can visit the website at innercityscholarshipfund.org. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with more Open right after this. Hey, creative family. My name is Timothy Coleman, and I'm the director of education here at BronxNet. And I'm standing in BronxNet's media and technology studios in the South Bronx because I want to let you know about an amazing program that we're bringing back that highlights the creativity of community members just like you. Emerging Media Makers is a show that introduces you to BronxNet certified producers. They've taken a step in their creative journey by enrolling in BronxNet's media training classes. On this show, you'll get to see the many ways that our certified producers have created a space that's all their own. Emerging Media Makers, your passion lives here. Welcome back. National Dance Institute's goal is to support the social and emotional development of children through active participatory arts experiences. 
The Institute will feature an event captivating audiences with performances that celebrate our planet's natural wonders and confront urgent environmental issues. Here now to tell us more is a senior teaching artist and choreographer at National Dance Institute, Mary Kennedy. Mary, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Now, can you share with us what initially drew you to dance and how your journey with the National Dance Institute began? I would say I am I grew up in a big family. My mom turned on the music. We danced at home. I had an older sister who was like on the dance team. She'd teach me routines. And I grew up in the 80s. It was the time of MTV and music videos. So I was very inspired by that and pop icons of that day. And as far as my journey with National Dance Institute, that began in 2000. I attended NDI, as we also say NDI, uh, our two-week uh, two teacher training program. And once I, w I was invited to, to come back and to assist and be a, a part-time employee with NDI. Now, how did yeah. NDI shape your approach to dance education? Well, it was interesting. I, before uh, I worked for NDI, I was teaching in studios, dance studios. So I came across a book, and it was called Teaching the Magic of Dance that was written by Jacques D'Amboise, who's the founder of National Dance Institute. And it sort of opened up my world about arts education. And it doesn't have to be a specific, like, I'm teaching in a studio. It can be for all children in public schools. And uh, so I would say it really expanded my view. Yeah. Now, Earth Song is described as a dynamic exploration of the planet's ecosystems through dance. What was the inspiration behind this theme? And how did you develop the concept for this event? Yes, uh, well, I would say initially my love of oceans and living, living in different environments by the ocean, in the mountains, uh, by the river, here in New York, our, our treasured public parks. And I would say uh, just the love of the natural world. And I think the concept for the show really grew from, a, it was a collaborative effort with my colleagues. Now, can you yeah. talk about the importance of kind of combining the world of dance and the art of dance with something that's very like, uh, the I would say like uh, a science theme, uh, which is like the earth. Can you talk about the importance of combining those things? Because I think that when we think of school, they're often very separate. Yeah. Uh, so can you talk about that? Um, just kind of that journey with combining them together? Yeah, I think it makes it more just experiential. The children are not just learning about it, but they're they're moving to it. They're, they're expressing themselves physically. And uh, so, and there's live music we at NDI, we pride ourselves on uh, having live music. So, you know, you're working with a professional choreographer who has, you know, a, a concept and you're in process with these children developing this idea. So I feel like it's very experiential and uh, beyond just, you know, reading about it, actually moving is another great way to learn. <laughs> that's that's amazing. Yeah. And I like to hear that, like, uh, there's more ways to learn than just reading. Yes. Um, and for some kids, you know, artistic um, education can be a way to learn more about things that they didn't know about before. So Absolutely. I think that's amazing. Um, you know, can you talk about how these performances address specific environmental issues like pollution, deforestation and wildfires? Yes, uh, we have a dance that's addressing wildfires. It's called Through the Fire and Haze. It will be performed by our oldest dancers, our seventh and eighth grade. And it's about, it's inspired by the Canadian wildfires that happened last summer, uh, 2023, when our skyline, our New York City skyline turned orange. So uh, we're, we're dancing about that. Another dance has to do with water pollution and the Cuyahoga River um, in Ohio that burned 13 times and really sparked the formation of the Environmental Protection Agency and the Clean Water Act. And the, and the first Earth Day. So we're addressing those problems, and but we're also, we want to highlight the beauty too and solutions. And how do you, um, I guess, approach these really hard concepts that even adults struggle to understand? How mm. do you put it in a way that children uh, understand it, but then can also convey that through dance? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> Or, or maybe what are some challenges with um, trying to kind of have these uh, these really sh like um, heavy themes? Uh, what are some challenges kind of teaching that to kids? Yeah, I think it's just a matter of really breaking it down so it's understandable to these children and, and maybe relating it to something that they they can understand. Uh, so I would just say that, like breaking, breaking it down, and that's 
also part of our methodology as teachers. Teaching dance is breaking down the movement, you know, breaking down the music. So, so with a theme, I would say it works that way too. Now, one of NDI's goals is to use art to engage children from diverse backgrounds and abilities. Can you talk about the importance of that representation, um, especially, uh, you know, in theater or dance, um, you know, to have kids be able to see themselves and to kind of uh, use their, their bodies and their minds to kind of convey these messages? Yeah, absolutely. What's unique is, you know, we have about 150 children involved in this production. They're from all over New York City. They've been working together for like six to nine months, you know, sweating, working hard, working through challenges. And so I just think the opportunity for all of these children from all backgrounds coming together to put on this performance and also what happens backstage and like the whole world where they're interacting with one another backstage uh, is, is a beautiful thing. And uh, so, yeah. And what has the feedback been um, from the children involved? They, uh, I feel like children I've read, you know, are natural environmentalists. I work in schools where there's a lot of messaging around the school about Earth Day and reduced plastic pollution. So I feel like children naturally understand this topic. So, and, and there's many books, children's books written about it. So I feel like they're into it and they, they can identify. And of course, it's important for them. They're the future of, of our planet, so. What advice would you give to young aspiring dancers who want to use their art to make a difference in the world? I would say, do your thing, you know, that's it, it's a beautiful thing. And just to be open to other opportunities that may come your way. Dance is, you know, it doesn't have to be one thing. Like I was saying before, b being in the dance studio, like just be open to, you know, what opportunities are involved in this world of dance. Now, lastly, is there a message you'd like to share with the viewers about the importance of arts in education and personal development? Uh, I would say it goes back to our mission that arts have a unique way of uh, empowering children from all different back backgrounds and motivating them toward excellence. So every child deserves the right to engage and learn through, through the arts. Yeah, I, you know, just hearing um, and what I've learned so far, this sounds like an amazing experience for the kids. Um, I love the theme of, and, I, and again, I just love the combination of the arts and the sciences coming yes. together. I think it's something that we don't see often. Um, and so I was really excited to learn more about this. And, you know, with that, I want to say thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, and, you know, kind of educating our viewers about what's actually happening in the world and how we can use art to kind of address that. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> For more information, you can visit their website at nationaldance.org and follow them on X at National Dance. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with more Open right after this. I remember when the Bronx did not really have a media outlet properly representing the people of the Bronx. BronxNet provides for the community by being a community where people can be empowered to share their voices. We are in a really great place technologically. We've got all the resources that we need to be effective. Whether it's through cameras, storytelling, editing, we have provided those services for 30 years. BronxNet's mission is to be a voice for the community. To educate, to inform, and to inspire. And you can be a part of it. We've built studios for you. Welcome back. It's estimated that 2.8 million adults in the United States live with schizophrenia. Patients experience cycles of crisis that disrupt many areas of their life, from personal relationships to professional aspirations. The stigma surrounding schizophrenia only adds to these challenges, making education and empathy crucial components in addressing this issue. 
Joining us now is a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner, Desiree Matthews. Desiree, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Now, um, as we talk about schizophrenia, a lot of people have these ideas on what it is, but can you, you know, from your experience and background, tell us what schizophrenia is and how does it affect the brain and our behavior? Yes, that's a really great question. I think a lot of us um, may have had experience of learning about mental health conditions, say through TV, uh, movies. When it comes to schizophrenia, it is a chronic brain disorder, so there's no cure at this time. However, I think it's important to share with the audience today that there is effective treatments for adults living with schizophrenia. We know schizophrenia can affect the way that somebody feels, how they behave, um, really how they interact with the world and experience the world. With schizophrenia, individuals can experience hallucinations, so hearing or seeing other things that really other people don't experience. We can have delusions or false beliefs. We can have changes in mood, lack of pleasure or interest in things, changes the way we learn our memory. So this uh, disorder can really affect all facets of life. That's why it's important to intervene early, to make the diagnosis early, and to have consistent treatment early on in the course of the illness. Now, why is this condition considered a complex and chronic brain disorder? So first, uh, there's no cure, number one. So it is chronic, it is persistent, necessitates lifelong treatment. And what makes it difficult to treat is, uh, I would say in my clinical experience, the need to take daily medication. I'm not sure about you, Kevin, but I know for me, it's hard to take medication every day. And um, there's no exception with mental health or schizophrenia. And for individuals living with schizophrenia, even missing just a few medication doses a month can really increase their risk of having a relapse. And the relapses can be devastating. They can disrupt daily life. They can make it harder for us to treat the symptoms in the future. Um, so consistent treatment is very important for these individuals. Now, I'm curious to know, are there any early signs of schizophrenia that might appear during adolescence or childhood? Oh, that's a great question. So we do see uh, individuals with schizophrenia, we can see a prodrome or kind of these precursor symptoms. They may be subtle behavioral changes, um, changes um, in interest. People may withdraw and not engage in activities. Um, they may become increasingly suspicious of, of people. And um, oftentimes it's not until, you know, um, you know, graduating high school, maybe people are working off in college, and all of a sudden the family is getting a phone call um, that their loved one is, you know, having, you know, psychosis, the hallucinations, the delusions, um, and this can be very frightening both for the individual and for the family because oftentimes with the stigma, there is a lot of unknowns, there's a lot of misconceptions. Now, can you actually address the stigma that faced so many people living with schizophrenia? As we mentioned, a lot of times we're learning about mental health disorders from what we see in the media, TV, uh, movies, and that's not always 100% accurate in the portrayal. And we just came out of Mental Health Awareness Month in May, and part of my partnership here today with Johnson & Johnson is to bring the education and to get the conversation going about schizophrenia and really showing people that there is hope, that there is effective treatment, and people can really thrive post-diagnosis with the um, appropriate treatment option. So I would say there's hope and just having the conversation can destigmatize and help people open up to reaching out for help, whether that to be, you know, initially to family, to talk to a healthcare professional. So that way we are able to provide those treatment options. Now, what are some common obstacles that face or that patients face when seeking treatment for schizophrenia? Uh, so certainly, most of the time, people are initially offered an oral medication, but we do have modern schizophrenia treatments that can make it easier for individuals to stick with treatment, to take treatment, as well as uh, the need for a daily pill. This reminds people oftentimes of their illness. So we have long-acting injectable medications now that offer a variety of flexible dosing options to meet the patient's need. With Johnson & Johnson, we have three 
available LAI options for adults with schizophrenia. We have Invega Sistena, which is given every one month. We have Invega Trinza, which is given every three months. And lastly, we now have Invega Hafira, which is given every six months. So now we are allowing, you know, appropriate adult patients with schizophrenia the options of taking treatment just twice a year rather than having to take a pill 365 days of, year, of the year. So a lot more flexibility to meet the treatment needs of these adults. Now, when we talk about stigma, uh, this also impacts, you know, the family of those um, who may live with schizophrenia. You know, how can family members and friends support someone living with this condition um, and ensure that they're kind of uh, disregarding or stay away, staying away from stigma? So it first starts with education, and there's a lot of advocacy groups um, across the country um, and getting involved in the community with support groups, advocacy groups is, I think, the first step. It helps you understand, um, you know, what to recognize in your loved ones. If there is, you know, a concern where you need to talk to a healthcare professional about, you know, making treatment changes, for instance, but also it helps you understand how to take care of yourself um, because you need to take care of yourself first and foremost to be able to take care of your loved one living with schizophrenia. And I think also the education on what treatment options are available is really important because a loved one um, may not be able to always advocate for themselves in certain situations. So for that loved one to understand the treatment options available and to really talk um, as a treatment team about all the risks and benefits of the treatments, including the LAI treatments I mentioned with Johnson & Johnson. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, a lot of what we learned is from the media. Um, so that could be movies, uh, online posts, um, which means that people can be um, vulnerable to misinformation. Where can people go that is going to offer credible resources and information about living with this condition? Oh, that's a great point that you bring up. There's a website called treatyourschizophrenia.com. That's treatyourschizophrenia.com. And it has information about the signs and symptoms of schizophrenia, but also about the long-acting injectable medications for adults living with schizophrenia that we mentioned today. And I know we talked about uh, some of the challenges, but do you have any success stories or examples that you can share where patients significantly benefited from consistent treatment and support? Oh yes, I worked in community mental health for over eight years and um, I've had many individuals thriving despite living with schizophrenia, anywhere from being able to go back to college, graduating, um, getting married, having families. So um, if anything, there very much is hope. Of course, there's always going to be some challenges living with any chronic disorder, but just really instilling that there is hope out there with early treatment and consistent treatment. Well, Desiree, I want to thank you so much for joining us and having this very important discussion. Thank you so much for having me today. For more information, you can visit their website at treatyourschizophrenia.com. We've come to the end of our show today. I'd like to thank all of our guests for joining us and you, the viewers, for tuning in. If you miss any part of today's show, you can catch the Recable cast on Optimum Channel 67, Verizon Files Channel 2133, or watch anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. You can catch a brand new episode of Open with Rena Valentine on Friday. This wraps up this episode for us. I'm Kim Naline. Make sure to keep this channel wide open. Take care. <laughs>